Welcome everyone uh, to this lecture series on Synchrophaser technology. So the first uh, lecture module is basically the motivation for Synchrophaser technology. Now the thing is, before we get into what Synchrophaser technology is all about, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, why do we need Synchrophaser technology? What special thing can it provide us that the previous technologies could not? So that is the main essence of this lecture module where we will look at what are the things that motivated for the birth of this synchrophaser technology. So the first thing is the power system operational paradigm. So in the power system we are basically focusing at this point of time on the transmission level. So we have the power systems and we are gathering the data through the sensors like the remote terminal units which get the data from the current transformers which are the CTs and the potential transformers which are the PTs and then they give these analog values or signals uh, to the SCADA technology which communicates the data and sends it to the control center. In the control center we have the EMS, the energy management system and all these data that come in they will get into the different algorithms that is running as, a, uh, as engines in the EMS and the EMS will tell the user that whether the power system is operating the way they want it to operate or if there is any problem in it, is there any stability problem for example, if there is any problem what are the control actions that are required. So all these kind of things are based on the different computations that are going on in the EMS and based on those the power system operators can decide what control actions they need to give to the system if they need those kind of things to make the system behave the way they want it to. So in short this is what the power system operational paradigm is all about. Sense, communicate, compute and monitor and control if necessary. Now let's look at what is the traditional way of measuring and monitoring the power system. When we talk about this point we mainly are focusing on the SCADA technology and in the SCADA technology what happens is you are having the current transformers and the potential transformers which you can see in the slide and these are giving the analog voltage and current signals to the SCADA system like we discussed in the previous slide and then the SCADA gives the data to the EMS. Now one of the important things that we need to see here is how fast is the data going from the SCADA to the EMS. Now typically it has been seen that utilities get the data from the SCADA once in 4 to 6 seconds. Now this can vary, it can become let's say less than 4 seconds or may become a bit higher than uh, 6 seconds, maybe 10 seconds or something like that. And all the algorithms that form part of the EMS, they are getting the data after every 4 to 6 seconds or something like that. So that is basically what is happening. But the main question arises here, is what happening here the best way to monitor a power system? That's the question. And if we look at some important things we can see that in fact when let's say some disturbance takes place if you want to study those disturbances or if you want to study how the system behaves after the disturbance which is the post disturbance analysis then if you are getting the data just at the rate of 4 to 6 uh, seconds once in 4 to 6 seconds then probably that is not enough because the system, the power system tends to change very quickly. It's a dynamic system. It tends to change very quickly when these disturbances happen. 
So if we are not able to capture the dynamics of the power system in a good way, then we lose a lot of data. We lose a lot of information. When I say data, it means information. Some valuable information are already lost. And in such cases, we are not going to see the exact behavior of the power system. If we are not able to see the exact behavior of the power system, then we might not end up taking the right control actions. We might take some wrong control actions. Let me give you an example to support what I'm saying. If you see this uh, figure that I've provided here, it shows the voltage disturbance on April 5th in 2011. On the y-axis, you can see the voltages that are mentioned in uh, per unit values. And you can also see the time axis on the x-axis. Now, the scalar measurements were obtained once in every four to six seconds. And you can see that it does not show the oscillations that are happening in the voltage in that particular system. When we tried to see what actually happens in that system, we saw a lot more oscillations are happening. The SCADA is not able to capture that. If we are not able to capture these kind of oscillations, how do we think that we are going to take proper control actions to stop these oscillations? You are not even able to see those oscillations. How do we control those oscillations? Then? That's the problem. So we need data at much faster rate than once in four to six seconds. We need data at sub-second rates these days. If we want to monitor the system really closely, if we want to monitor the system dynamics in a better way. So that's the first shortcoming of the existing technology that motivates the development of a newer technology. Now, if we look at another important point, we can see that in the SCADA technology, we are trying to gather the data from the different parts in the power system. And even though the data might have some timing, but the problem is that if one substation is sending data to a control center, let's say, and the other substation is located quite far away, and it's going to send the data as well to the same control center. First of all, because of the geographical distance, the substation which is closer to the control center will get to send the data much quicker than the substation which is located far apart. Now, like I mentioned, they might have some timing preferences. They know that, okay, this substation is located close and we can have some local clocks to stamp the data coming from those substations so that we know that what time those data belong to. But there is a problem in this. The problem is, now the different substations are not having the clocks which are internally time synchronized. So it's just like this, if I have a watch, if, I, if I'm saying that now, now the time is this, another person can tell me that his watch is showing a time which is one second apart or one minute apart maybe. The same thing happens we, because the clocks or the watches are not time synchronized centrally. So then even if they have some kind of a time stamp so to say, it might be highly possible that because of the lack of the time synchronization, the time skew will be there when the data comes to the sub, from the substations to these control centers. And if we get the data which are not properly timestamped or accurately timestamped, we do not know for sure what time that data belong to. And the power system being so dynamic can change, especially during the contingencies or any kind of disturbances. It changes so quickly that if we do not have the time synchronized data from the wide area perspective of the system, we might not be able to get the right information about the power system. If you see what I kind of mean in this figure, you can see that there was an event that took place which was a line trip and that's shown in the red color. 
and you can see that the power goes down significantly because of the line trip. At the same time, there were two generators that reduced the power delivery. However, you can see one important thing in this. Even though these events happen simultaneously, there is still a lot of time skew or a time gap in between. So that means we are not getting the data from the overall power system in a time synchronized manner and in which case we are losing out some important information of what's actually happening in the system. And the main reason being not proper time synchronization being there in the system. There is no time synchronization at a universal or central level for all those substations. So these kind of problems happen with the existing technology. Now let's get into the next point which is also a very important point. As we all know this SCADA technology is giving us the magnitudes of the different quantities, the electrical quantities like voltages or currents. Now we need to think about something which is very important. The networks that we are analyzing or trying to analyze, they are mainly AC networks. In AC networks, there is one very important thing apart from magnitude and that is angle because they become phasers. A phaser will have a magnitude and an angle. If you just look at the magnitude and not look at the angle locally, then again you might lose some important information. There may be some control techniques or control actions that make use of local data from the substation and where they should actually make use of angles as well. They do not make use of angles and they just make use of magnitudes. And in that case, they might end up monitoring the system wrongly. Let me show you a very interesting thing here. This uh, figure just shows uh, I mean, two buses in a power system. And you can see that if you want to see the power flow between bus 1 and bus 2, it's not only dependent on the magnitude of the voltages at the two substations, which is V1 and V2, but it's also dependent very heavily on the sign of the angular difference between the voltage phasors, which is phi1 minus phi2. Now, you can see that even if V1 and V2 are equal, that is fine. Power can still flow as long as there is an angular difference between phi1 and phi2. If phi1 becomes equal to phi2, the power transfer will become zero. That's how important angle information is. Angles decide heavily how much power is going to flow between the buses. And that's why angles are excellent indicators of power system stress. So it has been seen that in stress conditions, the angular separation between the buses, they keep increasing. So just by looking at the angles, even if you have some technology to look at the angular separation in an area between two buses, let's say, in real time, then you know what is exactly happening between those two buses in that particular uh, region. Let me show you an example. You can see that on August 14, 2003, when the, when the famous blackout took place, you can see the bus angular separation during the normal conditions just before the blackout or the collapse took place, it was around 25, 30 degrees. Now when the blackout took place and as the system got uh, more and more stressed, the angular separation between the two buses as indicated by the blue line and the red line, they started increasing a lot. And you can see that during the collapse, the, the angular separation was more than 100 degrees. If at that point of time, there would be these kind of technologies which could enable the system operators to monitor the system, 
or at least part of the system, angular differences or angular separation, they could have easily probably seen that the system is getting more and more stressed and a proper control action could have been taken and the system could have been probably saved. So that is how important is monitoring of angular separation in real time, locally which again, unfortunately, the present technology of SCADA cannot provide us. So these were the very important things that I just wanted to point out before moving to the main chunk of this series, which is on synchrophaser technology. So as to bring in to your minds why we need a synchrophaser technology what is the motivation for it? 